Pamela Watson was born in Perth, Australia, where she loved to see the golden sun setting across the Indian Ocean into Africa. She followed the trajectory of the sun, and when she arrived, she did the unthinkable. She rode a bicycle all by herself across the continent, traversing a distance of more than 14,000 kilometers. More than just a bike rider and adventurer, Pamela is also an author, entrepreneur, and management consultant in Africa's toughest business environment, a place called Lagos, a mega city in Nigeria. She knows all about the legendary scams for which Nigeria is famous, but Pamela Watson says Lagos, Nigeria, and Africa have a lot more good news stories than the world knows. She describes Africa as having some of the most productive, resilient, creative people on the earth. It is a picture she paints most beautifully in her book, Give Us Moon Over Lagos. My thoughtful business conversation with Pamela Watson reveals her mission is to transform views and ideas about modern Africa and encourage business and social enterprise for a continent with a promising future. My name is Philip Nyako, your host on African Port Business Forum. And here is the full interview in which Pamela Watson talks about growing up in Perth, Australia, with dreams of Africa in her heart. What I do recall as a, as a young kid growing up in Perth was watching the sun go down over the Indian Ocean. And as it disappeared over the horizon, I was wondering what was out there. And of course it was Africa. There's nothing really between Perth and Africa and I really wanted to go there. And it was after I'd studied, after I'd done my MBA, that I finally got the chance to travel there and I travelled down the Nile. And that was a quite an experience because that was a mixture of train and uh, felucca and boat across uh, um, Lake Aswan and then train again and truck uh, to Khartoum. And uh, yeah, I kept going all the way down to Dar es Salaam but by a mixture of transport. But it, it was very exciting, great adventure, and I think that sparked my love of adventure. But it also confirmed that I just felt at home in Africa, and I want, once I left and flew away, I couldn't wait to get back. Funny you say, you know, taking that step is, is what sparked your sense of adventure, but I wonder if that is entirely true, because there would have been uh, friends you had in Perth back then who saw the same sun setting towards Africa but never felt like following <laughs> the sun like you did. Uh, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so where did the sense of adventure come from for you? I, I think I like unpredictability. And there was a certain predictability about how my life would turn out if I stayed in Perth. And, and I felt like, yes, you know, very pleasant life, um, but I wanted something more. When you first stepped out of Perth, again, emphasising that Perth is one of the most isolated cities in the world, what, how did you feel? Didn't you feel you, 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 you had misplaced yourself, if I can put it that way? I first left Perth to go to Sydney. And I can remember that there was an overwhelming sense of loss of control that in Perth I felt I knew, for example, on any weekend, I knew all the activities that were happening in Perth. We were a, we were a small village and they might have been far apart, but it was somehow quite manageable. And when I arrived in Sydney, I, I, I can remember being overwhelmed and it get, made me quite anxious and I kept on being hungry to try and try different things because surely I should be able to try them all. Uh, and I, it took a while to actually learn to let go and that, you know, I was in a place where there was a feast of, of activities and one couldn't do them all. Yeah. But at least, you know, Sydney is still Australia, you know, a similar culture. But going over to Europe, and we're focusing specifically on Africa, is a whole different ball game. Look, I, I first, uh, my first overseas um, trip 
was actually to do my MBA in Canada. I got a Commonwealth scholarship. And that was quite a culture shock going there. Um, that was after I'd been in Sydney. Um, and the culture shock there was the cold. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and so, uh, yeah, that... that um, uh, was a taste of, of a completely different pl- place. Um, but seeing as you're sort of pushing me, I, 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 I guess part of my sense of adventure came, came from my parents, um, that they had travelled in the 1950s to Europe on a, on a ship um, before I was born. And they had spent six months travelling around Europe and that was very unusual for that particular time. And... Then when I was uh, in my teens, we actually, they took me out of school so that we took three months um, that I could go to Europe and, and visit Europe with them. So I guess for my parents as well, there was a, a value placed on travel and experiences in foreign places that perhaps other, other families didn't. But, you know, the other thing is, although Perth is an isolated place, it means that you're there looking out at the world and wanting to be out there in the world. And I I think that's shared by a lot of Western Australians. So it's a place, isolated as it is in your words, uh, kind of give birth to an adventurous spirit. Yeah, and just think, we're not a, 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 a an old state. Uh, 1827, you know, when the first uh, the, the colony was established and the people who came were very adventurous to put down roots in such a remote corner of the world so I think there's a stock of people <laughs> who, who were pretty adventurous in coming out I think my my grandmother came in the 1920s uh, just after the first world war and she came on her own um, from Scotland and uh, had um had a, she'd had a job in Socky Hall Street in Glasgow. She'd met a, a soldier, an Australian soldier, and she was the youngest in a family of 15. And she got herself passage to come out to Perth just to see whether there was any future with this man. But on arrival, she got her own accommodation. She got a job in another shoe shop here in Perth. And uh, eventually they did... Um, get married and you know the family f- came from there but she never got back to Scotland and I, I find that quite astonishing that that's that's really being adventurous and courageous to yeah. to uh, come to the other side of the world in those days when there was very little communication yeah and Pam one of the things that will always define you for a long time at least is the time you spent in Africa the as- African spirit that you took on and we know it's as a result of that you are able to write a book like this, Give Us uh, Moon Over Lagos. We'll talk about this uh, in a moment. But then it all started with you deciding to go and ride a bicycle across Africa. Wasn't that like one of the craziest ideas for a young woman? Or was it smart? And why was it smart? Where did you get the idea? I had, by this stage, I'd been living in London for about six years, and I was a career woman. I was a um, um, strategy and change management consultant with one of the very large international consultancy practices. I'd gone to London because I was promised that I would have some work in Africa. Uh, that, that was always part of my, my career plan. Uh, but the kinds of work that I was getting in Africa in those days was privatisation work and I didn't find that so satisfying. And I went to the Royal Geographical Society in London on a rainy Monday night, I remember that. On Monday nights there's lectures at which different people come to talk about different adventures or expeditions. And this particular Monday night an Englishman came to talk about his bicycle expedition in South America. And while I was watching his slides of him carrying a bike up a, up a mountain and he was so animated and you could feel the, the energy coming out of him and here was I feeling a bit stifled by, by my work. 
that I just thought, that's what I'm going to do. That I'm, I'm going to quit and I'm going to cycle across Africa. And it was, it was a light bulb moment like that. It just that. happened in an instant. It happened in an instant. One of the first things I did was start to tell people. It was almost like I was telling people in order to test their reactions and whether I was serious. Whether you were crazy. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. But the more that people said that, the more determined I became to do it. <laughs> so how did you... Choose the bicycle. I, I quit my job and spent six months in London planning for the expedition. And the woman who ran the workshop where I took my bicycle for repair, Nina Onasuni, I went to her to ask for her advice about what kind of bike. And she suggested that I get a custom-built bike that... In those days, in, this was in 92, that it was right at the end of the era when frames could be hand-built. They weren't aluminium. They were made with this Reynolds 531 alloy and, and that's you can cut and, and uh, I guess, weld together. And in the basement of her workshop, <laughs> there was a man who I'd only rarely seen. He, spent, he seemed to spend his entire life in the basement uh, his name was Tom Board, and he was renowned as a frame builder. And I rather fancied the idea of having a custom-built bike, especially as I'm quite short, and so it's difficult to find a bike that was the right size for me. So Ninon, though, provided a lot of advice about the kit because when you custom-build a bike, you've got to choose everything. And it turned out she, she gave me... Very good advice. She said, you need a strong bike for Africa, but you need one that's simple technology that can be fixed. And I wondered how it was that she had the knowledge to be able to provide that advice. And she said, well, I grew up in Nigeria. And her surname was a Nigerian name. And it turned out that her mother, an English woman, had married a Nigerian, after her husband had died and uh, Ninon had, had grown up in, in Ibadan. And so in undertaking this bicycle journey throughout Africa, how many kilometres did you put, not on the soles of your shoe, <laughs> but <laughs> on your bike? <laughs> it was 14,500 kilometres of cycling, 17 countries and 18 months. And I also did 1,750 kilometres on what was then called the Zaire River, the Congo River. My route started in Dakar, Senegal, and I went through uh, Senegal to Gambia, to Guinea, Mali, Burkina Faso, and then I dropped down through your country um, from the north, Ghana. Bolgatanga, yes, through Ghana. So Bolgatanga over to Borku and then Yeji, Kumasi, down to Cape Coast and then along to Accra. And then I went out to Togo, to Benin, to Nigeria, Cameroon, and then I decided to drop south. The Chad and Central African Republic weren't, weren't open for, for, for cycling for through. Um, so it was Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Congo, and then across the river into Kinshasa in, in DRC, what it's, it's called today. Um, but there's no road that would take me east. Uh, the only road would really go south um, into Zimbabwe. And I w wanted to finish in Dar es Salaam. And so from Kinshasa, I actually had to wait for two months because the time when I arrived in, in Kinshasa coincided with Mobutu Sesi Siko introducing the new Zaire. And there was hyperinflation. And there was no fuel for boats. There was... Nothing. It, it, it was, it, the whole economy seized up and I just had to sit and wait until things started to settle down. And then I was on a, a, a series of barges being pushed up the Congo for three weeks with a thousand other people. That was an extraordinary experience At, to arrive in Kisangani. And then I stayed about three weeks in Kisangani. I, I, by this stage of the journey, I didn't want it to end. And I knew that once I left Kisangani, I was really into the final stretch. And eventually I did push myself off and headed off into the forests of eastern, eastern Congo. 
uh, up over the mountains and down into the um, Lake uh, Kivu, is it, to Bukovu, to Rwanda. And I was in Rwanda six weeks before the genocide. Uh, into Burundi and then I went straight south to Gigoma in Tanzania and then I cycled, I followed the railway line in Tanzania, so Kigoma uh, to Tabora to Dodoma and then onto the road in, into Dar es Salaam. An incredible, intrepid spirit. So how long did it take you from start to finish? I started in October 92 and finished on April 7, 1994. Um, and that's 18 months. But I mentioned the date because I actually cycled into Dar es Salaam on the very day that the genocide started, that the night before the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi had um, been killed when the plane was shot down on arrival into Kigali. And when I arrived into Dar es Salaam, it was a day of mourning. It was a very, very... Uh, I don't, well, of course, uh, on that day, people didn't know what was going to unfold as a result. Um, but yes, yeah, a, a, a tragic day in Africa's history. I presume you would have learned a lot of lessons throughout these 18 months of an incredible journey. But can you tell me the most important thing you learn about yourself and Africa as a continent as a result of this unusual adventure? I tell people that the experience was one which gave me self-knowledge, that away from my own culture, away from the noise of daily life, I was the, the, the situations that I found myself in, I had to deal with them and, and adapt and, and be resilient to them but I, my safety was also uh, wrapped up in how I responded to situations. And I started to become much more aware that if I was irritated or angry in a situation, maybe there was a sea of children and they were all screaming and shouting, on some days I'd play with them and on other days I'd be so, you know, it, it, it was just all too much. And And the days were similar. So although the conditions changed, although uh, I might be in the Sahel, I might be in the forest, in fact, the welcome was always the same right across Africa. But daily, my, my response changed and it made me realise that it was me who was changing. It wasn't the situation, it was me. And it made me much more conscious of my emotions and where I was as a person. And I discovered that the more tired I got, the more on edge I got, the more anxious I got in situations. And to manage that, I slowed down. And in fact, in the, the fifth week of my journey, I was bitten by a dog. And this was pretty devastating because there were some Chinese doctors who told me that they couldn't sew up the wound. It was a big slash behind my left knee. By, by an Alsatian, and uh, they told me I couldn't cycle for one month. And I'd only been going for five weeks. This was in the highlands of Guinea, and I, I just thought, you know, it has all been so very hard, and I was really struggling to cope with this new life in the villages that I thought, you know, is this a message to give up? And actually in the period while I was sitting, waiting for my leg to heal... I got to know a, a young Cote d'Ivoirean woman who worked at the accommodation where, where I stayed. And uh, she said, Pamela, it was a good spirit that made the dog bite you. Clearly there was a bad spirit waiting further down the road to do something worse. And, and really you should slow down and then things will go better. And although I never really subscribed to the idea of spirits... It was her way of encouraging you. It was a way of encouraging me, and from then on I did go more slowly. But I, I really did get to, to know myself, because I, I think, um, you know, in business life, it's often easy to be blaming the situation for 
how it works out, how relationships work out, or blaming the other person. And I, I discovered that, that a lot of the response was up to me. And my strategy for being able to, to cope when, when really it was physically extremely demanding, much, much more demanding than I'd imagined. The roads were incredibly bad in those days. Pothole, not worked on for 30 years, slippery gravel. My bike would slip um, into gullies and I'm having to pull them out. And so I, I'd be arriving in the evening into a village looking for somewhere to stay, really, really tired. What I discovered was I could go for about three days and then I needed a day off. And so I started getting a new rhythm to my journey, whereas at the beginning I was beating myself up that I wasn't a real cyclist, I wasn't doing 100 kilometres a day, um, and that I needed to catch up. I'd made a plan of how far I should be. Um, you know, a good, good consultant. I had a 12-month... <laughs> Best month, plans. <laughs> yes, I had a 12-month base case, um, and it was a 15-month uh, worst case. And... Um, uh, you know, I was I was just slipping further and further behind. So so, but but in the end, after the dog bite, I just ripped up the uh, up the plan and and decided I would just and take decided it, to live take take each day as it came and to make sure that I was able to um, be resilient to the experience that I was going through. And in many ways, that's probably what you would have learned about many of the places in Africa where plans that are written on paper don't always work very well. People live according to the dictates of the environment and of the day. They do, um, absolutely. And I'm you know, in total admiration of Africans because you know, the, the situations of um, people both in the villages and the, even in the cities can uh, you know, be quite tough. And, and there is a real inner strength and, and resilience in people, which, which is strong. And in becoming an African as it were, you ended up in Nigeria, which meant that you ended up writing this book. Now, tell me what you found about Lagos, about Nigeria, that you recount in this book. When I first arrived in, in Lagos, it was quite overwhelming. I think many people um, externally perceive that it's a, 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 you know, too difficult, it's chaotic, it's dirty, it's noisy, it's large. Um, there's the idea of you know, corruption in the environment. And the Africans, uh, Ghanaians, were warning me about, about Nigeria. Oh, you know, just go quickly through Nigeria. This was when I was on the bike ride. Ghanaians in particular will warn you. <laughs> well, <laughs> Because there's a bit of I a love-hate love relationship, <laughs> relationship <there. laughs> yeah. But even Beninois, <laughs> Togolese, even the Cameroonian, even when I came out the other side. Um, and, I, and I think it's because it's big. Um, and when I first arrived uh, and I was working in a consultancy practice, an international consultancy practice, so I wasn't setting up my own business, uh, I, I had some trepidation. And it took some time, I have to be honest, to really get comfortable with that environment. But what I found, what it was that really made it worthwhile to be there was the Nigerians themselves, the, the Lagosians. Um, they just got so much optimism, despite the tricky environment, ambition, energy, very high energy, hugely funny, big belly laughs of, of humour coming out of them, and they'd make me laugh. And a capacity to m make humour out of the dire things that might be happening in the country. I, th I think they're actually quite s willing to see the problems that their own society has. And they laugh at them because that it has to be one of the outlets when, when you're powerless to change some of these things and they happen when, when the leadership do crazy things that, that are going to impact your life. The, the jokes, the stories that would come out in response to that um, you know, we'd be laughing, and yet it'd be something, something you know, 
really negative that w- that was going on. And I found that really admirable because that's another a resilient, the son of resilient strategy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I just love them. And, and the longer that I was there, the more comfortable I became. The, the life in Lagos is a roller coaster, a real emotional roller coaster, so that you can be on the highs of your life where um, things are so intense that when they go well, that the exhilaration is fantastic. And a lot of that comes because you're feeling you're having an impact. It's not because you won a contract. I certainly for me, a lot of the exhilaration came through um, maybe a good training program, and and you know you could feel that people were hungry for learning, and that they'd really absorb things, and were thanking me for for having helped them. But then that would be matched sometimes on the same day, but certainly in the same week by something going wrong, and you'd get plunged down into lows that were, were perhaps lower <laughs> than you might experience, certainly in a place like Perth. And in a way, it became addictive. Um, I think, you know, it's probably like crack cocaine or something, you know, some drug where you're up on a high and then you're down on a low, and it's, it's that shift um, which, is, which, which causes the addiction. And I think Lagos is a bit like that, that you, you, li- life is intense, and, and so you feel alive. Was there ever a time when you felt like giving up on Lagos, on Nigeria, on Africa, because it wasn't worth it? I think um, not so much during my time in Lagos. One of the toughest um, experiences that I had was during the bike ride when I accompanied Nigerians on the experience of having the 1993 election annulled and to arrive into this Nigeria that people had warned me about but to be welcomed by family in Abaddon um, and I did go down to Lagos to, to uh, renew my passport, I, ha- I had to. And it happened to coincide with the June 12, 93 election. And people were excited because this period, this 92 to 94 period, was when all countries were either just before their first election in the new democratic era, having it, as in Lagos, or uh, just afterwards. And what I experienced was it in the before period and in the after period, uh, during period, people were high. They had great hopes of the change that was going to happen. And afterwards, when the change didn't happen, they went low. But in Nigeria, it was extreme because from June 12, when there were such high hopes for change and finally an end to the military era, then I was cycling through Nigeria as as, um, Ibrahim Babangida went silent and wasn't announcing the results of the election and people didn't know what was going on. And I was in southern Nigeria and people were very tense. A lot of discussion every evening was along the lines of we can't have another Biafra. People felt that this head of state couldn't accept the result and that he was going to and announced that it was the person from the north who he was supporting as the winner. And, and, and so I was joining them in this, in this ride of, you know, what was going to happen. It was very tense. And then the bombshell came when I was in Calabar, when, when he came on the, the, the news um, to announce that he was annulling the election. And, and everybody was just stunned um, that, that this could happen. I joined them in that feeling. It, it just felt that you were being played, that you were being treated so you know, much of no consequence, that you put through this process of voting, of feeling things are going to change, and then he just announced that it was to be annulled. And, yeah, that I, I really felt for Nigerians. And what I really admired, though, because I kept watching it as I cycled off and they had to stay and live with the consequences, 
was that there wasn't an outbreak of war. There wasn't, you know, civil up and west. And I, that's a, something I do find about, about Africans is a stoicism and an acceptance, which perhaps sometimes has led to these leaders being able to stay too long. For me, that that was a moment when I, I when you you felt like almost giving up. Yeah, well, it, it just felt you know because every country was going through this process, and yeah. and this one was one that was really um, you know people being toyed with. Coming back to Lagos, you still retained a certain love for the the city and for the country, and largely for Africa, where you ended up writing this book that someone described as a love letter to Lagos, to Nigeria, and to, and to Africa. Just summarise what this book really is about, what it means to you. Well, having had the classic African adventure, cycling from one side to the other, being out in the villages, I wrote my first book, Esprit de Batuta, Alone Across Africa on a Bicycle. And... That, I think, matches the idea of a lot of people of both adventure and Africa. And when I went to Lagos, I went on a grand adventure. And what I've written is the, the, the story of, of my time there, which was running a consultancy practice, but the thing where my heart lay was running a social enterprise. We made handmade paper and paper products and I was creating employment and also recycling. The adventures there that I had, they, they were very special to me. And personal and, in many ways. Yeah, and very personal. But when I uh, that came the time that it was uh, time for me, me to leave, and I started sharing my story with, with Nigerians, I realised that my story could have been the story of any Lagosian. And further... Africa is changing so that people are leaving the village and coming to the big cities and 10,000 a day are arriving in Lagos. It's gone from a city of 10 million when I arrived there in 99 to 24 million today. Which is almost the entire population of Australia. Almost the entire population. I mean, it's mind-boggling. It's also got a GDP, which just the city of Lagos has a GDP which is more than the combined country GDPs of Ghana and Kenya. That's it's, incredible. It, that, that is incredible. But back to this, basically this is a um, contemporary African adventure. This, this, if people want to get to n understand what is going on in Africa and, and change their views to open their eyes up to the fact that Africa is not all about wars, not all about uh, endangered species, not all about uh, starving children, but is actually about dynamic young Africans trying to make their lives better through entrepreneurship, um, through employment, but battling against all sorts of challenges in large cities, then they can start to get a flavour of what it's really like in, in my book. You seem very convinced, like you've developed this conviction that Africa is not just about bad news, that there's a lot of good news there. Absolutely. And there, you know, there's, there's a middle class now which didn't exist back in, in 99. There's a, a cadre of people, young professionals, who are really striving to create new businesses that, that solve problems. So the telecommunications revolution uh, of the beginning of the millennium, that, that transformed lives. But now it's transforming business ideas. So there is fintech. There's so many different you know, individual ideas within those labels. But whether it's banking and being able to transfer money out to the poor mother who's out in the village um, more easily on a mobile phone and with, with mobile banking, um, or whether it's the farmer who's able to know the prices of, of crops 
um, through 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 um, a tech enabled app. These things are changing lives. Um, Lagos itself has gone from being pretty ramshackle and with maybe five restaurants to having a thriving media and art scene. The um, the music scene is phenomenal. You know, new new groups coming out. Um, Nollywood is is um, huge, and um, in arts, every time I go back to Lagos, not only are there fashion shows, are there art shows, um, there, there's operas being put on, you know, original operas that are being being written. So what I see that as a good news story is is that these are people who are just writing their own future. It's it's not the Africa where where they're waiting for someone in the West to provide aid or to uh, invest and and bring a business and bring jobs. These are Africans doing it for themselves. And I've seen just so many businesses take off um, in Lagos. So that, for me, is a really good news story. Afri- Africa's very young and they need jobs. People are coming to the cities in search of jobs. But there's also a population explosion. And uh, so Lagos, with its 24 million... Um, will grow to be perhaps the third largest city in the world by 2050. Uh, Nigeria is, you know, equally going, uh, you know, heading for 400 million. And these people need to be fed. And so there also is a focus on getting to food independence and a big focus on agriculture now, which there hadn't been before. And that's starting to transform the nature of agriculture and agro-processing. So there's a lot of change happening, which is very positive. And um, that confidence you're expressing, obviously, is confidence that can be um, said of the other capitals around the country, from Cairo to Johannesburg, from Nairobi to Accra. There is this spirit of entrepreneurship taking hold all over the continent and people wanting to make something of themselves and of their community. And as you said, fintech and technology is taking hold and and so many of that population are just moving ahead um, very much different from the picture people have in mind uh, maybe perhaps especially in the western world but at the same time people generally have this uh, idea that it's a place not fit for business do you think these are people that can actually may or rather may miss out on what's happening in africa each environment has its own special characteristics. Each sector has, has got its own problems. I, I'm a firm believer that business can succeed in Africa, it's sort of foreign business. Um, the diaspora in investing and, and they're growing businesses. Very challenging environment. So it's not, it's not, it's not something that can be done easily. It requires time to come up with plans which are taking account of, of all the challenges and I do think one needs scale of the investment probably larger than one would need in a different environment. The, the things that one needs to look for in the planning stage is not only all the things about the market opportunity and and just uh, look, looking at developing the financial plan, but it's very important that the partners that that one chooses to partner with in in the local environment that you've done due diligence. But the due diligence is not the due diligence of the West where one might just use a, an agency to, to check people out or check organisations out. But it's really getting to know people and getting to know the people who know those people and getting to know the culture. And so it takes time to do that because your success or failure will be based on the people that you're, you're deciding to partner with. And it's not only the ones who are perhaps joint venturing with you, it's also who is going to be your supplier, um, your employees, your key employees, uh, your bankers, uh, you, you know, getting to know the regulatory environment and who are the key players in that. 
and really being able to understand those relationships that are going to be important. So it's very important to take the time to, to work that out and then work out strategies about how one is going to ensure that the business ethics that you're um, holding to can be actualised when you're on the ground. And, that and that's where you come in as a business strategist and who have run your own successful businesses. Uh, there's a lot you, you have to give in that area, isn't it? The, just the sheer amount of uh, experience in business you've amassed, not just in the Western world, but also in the so-called developing world, but in the, in the strict context of Lagos and Africa. Yes, I do. I, I currently help help uh, um, not not only foreigners but but Africans as well to build businesses which are stress tested, and um, having been through it myself, and experienced business at, at the boardroom level of very large companies and understood the kinds of issues that were existing uh, in in those those large companies, and then run. Uh, smaller business and particularly my social enterprise I've seen the same kinds of issues but from different lenses and I think that's what provides me with the capacity to 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 see the system and 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 to then look at other people's ideas and to see where maybe they haven't thought hard enough about how they're going to really either protect their business or to build in the processes and controls that they need and some that that probably will mean putting in more money into the business than they anticipated and it probably means um, developing plans, not only taking time to develop the plan but anticipating that execution will take a lot longer. There will be more delays, ones that some you can predict and some you can't predict but you certainly can predict that there will be delays. Uh and I imagine being the business woman that you are with international experience, when you got a position to uh, become Australia's honorary consul in Lagos, you would have learned quite a lot uh, in that sense as well, seeing how businesses function with or without government support, um, whether it is uh, limited in some shape or form. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it is very important um, for foreign businesses that are going in that their um, trade officers and, and diplomat, diplomats have, have um, representation because these are challenging environments and policy changes do occur even after one's made an investment. And so you might have a contract that's been negotiated and you've got an understanding of the playing field that you're going into and then something goes wrong. And, and to have your, your country's representatives there to help you perhaps to um, bat, you know, to explain why proposed changes are unfair or um, negative to, to your business and the consequences that they will have for the country itself, perhaps, you know, um, creating unemployment. And I'm, I'm a strong advocate of Australia having a stronger direct representation in Lagos. As it is, you're back in Australia to Perth, your place of birth, and we'll be seeing other parts uh, of Australia. Um, how is uh, your book tour going, given that it's also part of of a business uh, w which helps you to tell an incredible story of your own life and of the people that you uh, have come to admire. I've, I've just arrived in Perth, um, been here this week. I had three fantastic events and a great warm welcome, I felt, um, particularly from the uh, Nigerian and African community. And I think there's a, what's come home to me is that... Africans uh, 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 would like Africa and, and Nigerians would like Nigeria to be perceived differently that some of the good news stories get out. And so I had one woman come up to me to actually thank me um, for speaking up and telling the stories that I was telling. And she felt that that provided an opportunity for her to be able to then tell her own stories, that if she just started without, without somebody from my background being able to corroborate things, 
then she felt she would be dismissed, but now she feels that she can step up and, and tell her own stories and be listened to. So that, that was a tremendous um, thing to hear. From Perth, uh, actually leaving uh, by car, going to drive across to the east of Australia, I decided that I've got to fit in a bit of an adventure during the book tour. So um, my partner Andrew and I are driving uh, across to Adelaide and then to Melbourne, to Canberra and to Sydney. And so that's going to be great fun and we've got events in, in all those capitals. So very much looking forward to um, meeting Australians who are interested in finding out about an, another side of Africa and learning all about my various adventures and, and hopefully to, to meet other African Australians, um, Nigerian Australians, Ghanaian Australians and all the rest. <laughs> and to have to drive across the Nullarbor from Perth all the way to the east of Australia would not be as exciting as riding a bike. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> It's the lazy way. <laughs> yes. Pamela Watson, it's uh, wonderful to um, have you on African Pod Business Forum. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Philip. It's been a pleasure. And that was the thoughtful business conversation with Pamela Watson, in which she reveals her mission to transform views and ideas about modern Africa and encourage business and social enterprise for a continent with a promising future. My name is Philip Nyakbo, your host on African Pod Business Forum. African Pod Business Forum is produced by African Pod Media in Perth, Australia, the Silicon Valley of mining, energy, and business. Subscribe free to our audio podcast. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcast. To find us on YouTube, just search for African Pod Business Forum. Our website, africanpod.com, has more information. And follow us on social media by searching for African Pod. And don't forget to check all of our previous interviews with exceptional guests, all on African Pod Business Forum. <laughs>